Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part four of my UML2 video tutorial. Today, we're going to talk about sequence diagrams. And as you can see, this is a sequence diagram here on your screen. And what a sequence diagram does, or a sequence diagram model, it models interactions in your program and provides a logical view of that. They are about showing the order of interactions between different parts of your program. And what you're going to do whenever you're laying out this diagram is you're going to describe which interactions are triggered and when, with a special focus on the order of events in all of those interactions. Now you can see what are called participants here as you see a note here that says participant and then you see the customer the card reader we scroll over the account and then down here we have the ATM now sometimes when these are modeled all of the participants are across the top but I just wanted to show you how it would look if we only showed the participants after they were created so let's just move into here and these participants can be objects or any other part of your program or system however you want to refer to it and the participants names are going to be structured first with the objects name and then followed by the class type however it is possible to have anonymous participants like an action listener like I talked about previously that waits for events and then triggers things to occur in the situation in which you have an anonymous action listener you would just have the colon here followed by the name of that action listener or that action listeners class without a name up here hence anonymous and the timelines or lifelines flow down the page and interactions are going to be shown between the different participants based off of the lines that are drawn from one participant to another as you can see here and the timeline is based on the order of interactions and not the amount of time between the interactions However, I'll also show you how to monitor time and show that certain actions need to be taken within a certain period of time later on in the tutorial. An interaction is going to occur when one participant, like we have here, the customer is the participant, sends a message to another participant. Now what I'm modeling here is an ATM machine, like an automatic teller machine. So here I'm saying that an ATM card has been inserted and that then will rely upon the card reader to verify the card. So a message is an event that is sent from a caller to a receiver. Now the message arrow itself has a description or a message signature, whichever you want to refer to them as, and that is going to sometimes have a variable out here or attribute, followed by equals with the message name or the method name that you're going to be calling, then followed by the name of the argument and the class of the argument, then another column and the return type. And then you can see an example of a real world example of that right here. I, however, in here, just to conserve space, just have the method type followed by the name of the attribute I'm sending then the class and I'm cutting out the rest of that but this is the more specific way that you can pass these messages or message signatures and then this guy right here with this line here with the filled in arrow is known as a synchronous message and you're going to use this type of arrow when a message is sent and the sender then waits for a response as you can see that they did right here asynchronous messages on the other hand and let's just scroll around here and find one as you can see right here, do not have a filled in arrow at the end of them. These are messages that are sent and then the participant continues to send messages without receiving a response. So like right here, what we're saying is get savings and then we're immediately passing over an amount. So here we're going to define that we want to pull money from the savings account and this is the amount that we want to pull from it. So we're sending two messages and not waiting for a reply between them. That is known as an asynchronous message. Now if we bounce back up here you can see over here a participant being the ATM machine is being created and this is how you would create another participant inside of here and like I said before you could either have it up here at the top or just put it down here where it's actually created and then later on down here you can actually see where a participant is actually destroyed and you note that it's been destroyed by passing delete and then putting an X where the participant previously would have been. Now sequence fragments, as you can see in an example of one right here, are boxes that surround interactions in a sequence diagram. And the top left corner contains a fragment operator, as you can see right there. And this is going to designate the type of fragment that you are going to be using. Now OPT in this situation designates an optional fragment that is only going to be used if the guard, which is this guy right here, evaluates to true. 
So what we're saying here is if they enter the wrong pin number more than three times, we are then going to pass back bad pin and maybe decide to destroy their card or do whatever we want to do in that situation. And this guy right here is known as a guard condition parameter. And it's very important to know that some sequence fragments use guard conditions while others do not. Then let's move around inside of here and you can see another sequence fragment over here. Remember I mentioned before that I may want to destroy destroy the card. Well, whenever you put any G inside of it, let's say that maybe in the future I might want to destroy the card, but as the system exists right now, I do not want to destroy any cards under any situation. This is going to surround interactions that won't ever be executed, at least at this time. And this is just set up so that we know that currently this is designated as something that should not be done. However, with a quick change to the sequence diagram, of course, we could decide to destroy cards if they enter the wrong pin more than three times. This guy right here is known as a reference sequence fragment. So let's say that you have a really complicated sequence diagram piece that you want to put inside of your sequence diagram and you want to actually create the whole thing outside of it to conserve space. In that situation you would just put REF and then you would give it a name and then over here you would put SD which just stands for sequence diagram or referenced sequence diagram followed by said name same exact name as you can see right there is used right here and then inside of this guy we can go and create all kinds of other things and ref is just going to be used to separate complex interactions from your sequence diagram and another thing is it's going to allow you to reuse a set of interactions so let's say i want to verify funds later on in my sequence diagram i can always just come over here and reference verify funds and it's automatically going to be able to do that and that's something to choose all the time then inside of here you can see how to set up a looping system and there's actually a couple different ways to set up loops right here what I'm doing is I'm saying that I want to continue to loop through all of these interactions that are surrounded with this box and these interactions will continue to occur until this guard condition right here comes back as false so we're going to continue to loop through this guy until the amount is less than or equal to the balance. Remember, false. And you could also define a minimum number of times you want to loop, like you only want to loop once, and a maximum number of loops, which would be 10. Or if you just put one number inside of there, like I did here with five, that means it's only going to loop through five times. And then you can see all of the different interactions that go inside of here. Then also inside of here, I have PAR. That is a reference to a a parallel sequence fragment and that declares that the interactions can occur in parallel however and this is sort of something that I didn't know if I should put in here or not whenever you put the line inside of here this dashed line that goes across right there that means technically that we should check funds in the checking account before we check them in the savings account but that's not exactly hundred percent has to be enforced however if we would take this dotted line out of here that would mean that we could actually check the savings account Account before the checking account and that would be perfectly fine there's a couple little things here that I'm going through that are not always enforced but in any way you'll get a pretty good idea how sequence diagrams work by just looking at this like I said before this is called a parallel sequence fragment and this whole entire thing can be used as a cheat sheet and I'll put a link under the video on where you can get that so then let's go back through here again and look at another sequence fragment this is the alternative sequence fragment and what we're gonna say here remember here's a guard condition Condition. And we're going to say if savings withdraw, we're asking them if they want to remove money from the savings or do they want to remove money from the checking. We are going to complete completely different operations or alternative operations based off of whether savings withdraw comes back as true or checking withdraw comes back as true. And then we are performing multiple different operations in that situation that are then being passed over into here. And remember I said previously about being able to define time constraints, which means we're going to send a message and then we're going to give them 10 milliseconds to respond. And then we would declare a response within five milliseconds, just like this. You would draw the line on a diagonal plane rather than drawing them on a horizontal plane, right like this. If a message is lost and you would like to define what happens when a message is sent and lost, like for example, maybe send 
find it again, this is the notation you would use. It would just be an arrow with a dot at the end. And if you would also like to figure out how you would interact if a message that was previously sent is found at a later date, that's how you would define it. Just a big giant dot and an arrow at the end and then followed with whatever you'd like to do thereafter. Assert, as you can see right here, specifies that interactions inside of this fragment must work perfectly or an exception is going to be thrown. So here we're just checking that the amount that they are asking for is less than the balance. And that's another way that we could throw an exception if they entered an amount that is more than they would have in the bank. You can also see another example of a loop right here. Here I'm saying that I want to loop through this guy five times. And then I'm throwing in a break statement. So I'm going to check funds a maximum of five times. However, if they do come in here and they ask for an amount that is less than the balance, I'm going to say break out of the loop. And that's what the break sequence fragment says. And then I'm going to perform operations that are going to be returned to the participant that started this loop. Another thing you can do is use critical. Let's say we are checking the checking account and we want to protect from someone else checking for funds inside of a checking account at the exact same time across town so that we don't provide the user with more money than they actually have in the bank. In that situation, we might want to use a critical sequence fragment. And what this is going to do is it's going to lock out operations on whatever this participant is like funds in the checking account until the all the operations are performed upon that element. And pretty much the only other thing I haven't talked about are nested messages. And nested messages occur when one message causes the receiving participant. So here's your one message and here is your receiving participant. So this one message is going to cause the receiving participant to send out one or more messages. That is known as a nested message. So that is pretty much everything you'd want to know about sequence diagrams. I'm going to double check here just to make certain that I didn't forget anything. And as far as I can tell, I did not. Feel free to leave any questions or comments below. And of course, if you want to go ahead and get this, there's a link to it. It's free and everything. Feel free to download it and do whatever you'd like with it. Leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.